Oh, hey, Meg. Hey. We did it. We're back for another riveting episode of the Orton Podcast. Is that the right word? Simply riveting. Simply riveting. So we were talking, and it turns out, uh, happy Labor Day. And our Labor Day weekend has been pretty crazy. So we wanted to jump in the studio, get into it, and do another episode. But I wanted to do a different state. And I wanted to do a little bit of some true crime. So I found a pretty interesting story about a new state. You have any guesses? You haven't really seen the notes yet, have you? No. Do you have a guess? Delaware. Ooh, really close. Washington. Oh. Not D.C., the state. It wasn't close. I was being funny. Uh, but either way, this is one of, if not the worst serial killer to have ever lived. It's pretty gruesome. Listener and viewer discretion advised. I feel like that's what the professionals say. And uh, we're trying to be a little more professional. No, we're not. Um, <laughs> but either way, <laughs> if you haven't read the description, because maybe reading's not your thing and it's a holiday, you don't have to. But we're going to talk about the dark path of Gary Ridgway, Washington's worst serial killer. Are you ready for this? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously, <laughs> Gary Ridgway, also known as, maybe you've heard of them, the Green River Killer. Mm -hmm. Oh, you have? Kind of. Okay. The name rings a bell. This sick, twisted individual confessed to more confirmed murders than any other American serial killer. Over a period of five months of police and prosecutor interviews, he confessed to 48 murders, 42 of which were on the police's list of probable Green River killer victims. And I'm not going to give you a spoiler alert. That number is less than actually they think. But you're going to have to listen or, I guess, skip ahead to a little bit more. But I say we do the introduction. Get into this. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. When should we do it? Right now. We did it. You survived the intro. Pretty cool. We made that ourselves. Pat on the back to us. But either way, let's get right into this. Before we do, make sure you guys check out our friends of the show, Rascal, R-A-S-K-L-L dot com. You can rock some bling like me. Maybe black's not your style. They got gold and silver as well. Check out our friends, Copper Johns. Labor Day weekend. If you're listening on Labor Day, it's the last day. You can get 25% off using code BEARDLAWS. If you're looking for a ball wash, go to theballwash.com. You're welcome. Keep them fresh. And last but not least, check out our friends, Brio. Brio for life. You can use code BEARDLAWS. VermontFlannel.com. You can use BEARDLAWS24 in Timber Rays. Meg's over there rocking some Timber Rays. This is the backup pair of Timber Rays. I was going to rock them today, but I have a hard time seeing the screen because I am blind. Meg, you want to rock these instead? Sure. Meg's rocking those ones instead. She just handed me the other pair of Timber Rays. That she had, and uh, which ones you like better? You got the, uh, for anybody just listening, this one's all black with the wood on the side. You like the all wood with the red tint? Mm -hmm. Heck yeah. Timberrays.com. All right, let's go ahead and jump into this. Like we always do, let's give you a little bit of an early life and a background of Gary Ridgway. It's not a good childhood, but I mean, you don't often hear of a serial killer that had a good life and a good upbringing. Born. February 18th, 1949, in Salt Lake City, Utah. Hey, Utah, Copper Johns, that would have been the better segue. He grew up in a deprived neighborhood near Seattle Seat Airport. Sure. Yeah. He was the second. SeaTech? SeaTech? Yeah, we'll go with one of those. He was the second kid of Mary and Thomas Ridgway's three sons. His home life was somewhat troubled. Relatives have described his mother as a domineering and have said that while young, he witnessed more than one violent argument between his parents. His father was a bus driver who had often complained about the presence of sex workers. Ridgway had a problem wetting the bed until he was 13 years old. Psychologists revealed that because of this in the mom's approach to cleaning him while uh, he had his little bedwetting incident without getting into too much gruesome details was not a good thing for the child and very inappropriate. Um, we'll leave it at that. I think that paints the picture, right? And because of these inappropriate 
body parts being clean the way that his mom did. Psychologists revealed that it actually led to severe anger and fantasies and, and, and things that he was into as an adult. And uh, apparently he did have fantasies of even killing his own mother. Not good. Not good. Uh, so Ridgeway had several difficulties in school. He had a very, very low IQ that was in the low 80s. And obviously there was early, you know, incidents of violence and he was dyslexic, which made things a little more difficult in school, probably bullying, teasing, you know, kids being kids, kids are jerks. If you're listening to this for whatever reason, you're a kid, still viewer discretion advisor There's going to be a lot of adult words. So maybe you turn it off, but don't be a jerk at school. But because of the dyslexic, he was actually held back. So he was older as well. Just not a lot of good things in the school, not a good school thing. But this story is pretty dark as well. He was 16 and he ended up leading a six-year-old boy into the woods, stabbing him through the ribs into his liver. He didn't just stab him once. He stabbed him six times. And as he walked away after stabbing this kid, he said, I always wondered what it would be like to kill someone. I did a lot of research to see if there was a death, he was never charged. So I have to imagine the kid that was stabbed did live, huh. <clears throat> but nothing to confirm that there was a death. So I have to imagine that uh, there would have been criminal records and stuff for that. But could you imagine 16 years old brings a six year old into the woods to kill him, stabs him six times at poor kid. Unbelievable. Sad. It is. Mm -hmm. He then graduates high school. In 1969, he marries his 19-year-old school girlfriend, Claudia Craig. He then joins the Navy, and he was actually sent to Vietnam and served on a supply ship and saw combat. But during his time in the military, he ends up getting gonorrhea, which, in a poll that I read, for people that don't speak English, gonorrhea is one of the funnest words to say. It was voted. <laughs> I mean, if you didn't know the meaning of it, it's a pretty fun word to say, right? <laughs> sure. But he gets gonorrhea from being with several sex workers. His marriage ends within a year. He then, you know, goes on to marry Marcia Winslow and actually became religious. He often read the Bible and insisted that his wife follow the teachings of their pasture. Even when married, he began uh, in, in being religious, he would still solicit sex workers and would want his wife to engage in sexual activities in public and even more disturbing in areas where his victims' bodies were found. Oof. His marriage, no shocker here, ends, but not before having a son. The marriage ended not only because of the cheating, but it was actually reported that he would choke her in violent rages. You might be thinking, like, why are you talking about the choking? Why is that important? That's his means of killing people. And it started with somebody that he was loving while he was, air quotes, religious. So I think we just jump right into here to the first murders. Throughout the 1980s and the 1990s, Ridgeway is believed to have murdered at least 71 teenage girls and women near Seattle and Tacoma, Washington. 71, it's believed. Wow. Unreal, isn't it? Um, so in court, Ridgway later admitted that he had killed so many victims that he actually lost count. The majority of these murders did occur between 1982 and 1984. Most of the victims were either sex workers or runaways whom Ridgway actually lured along the Pacific Highway South. He gained their trust. He sometimes showed him a picture of his son. After engaging in sexual activity, Ridgway would strangle the women from behind by wrapping his forearm around their necks and pulling back with his other arm as tightly as he could. He carried out most of these killings in his home, his truck, or in very secluded areas. The bodies of the victims were typically dumped in wooded areas around the Green River near Seattle-Tacoma International Airport. Apparently these are a thing for airports, huh? Back to the childhood trauma. And other sites within South King County. Two confirmed and two suspected victims were also found in the Portland, Oregon area. The bodies were often led in clusters, sometimes posed, and usually in the nude. Ridgway would sometimes return to these sites to engage in necrophilia, though he later stated that it was kind of 
It wasn't really sexually satisfying for him, but it was a, a way to reduce his need to seek out new victims, lowering his chances of being caught. To further mislead investigators, he would occasionally contaminate the dump sites with items like gum, cigarettes, and rip materials belonging to other people. He even transported some victims' remains across state lines into Oregon to confuse authorities. Huh. Disgusting, isn't it? Mm-hmm. But the first known victims were actually found July of 1982. A unique kind of spray paint was found on clothing wrapped around the victim's neck, but the paint wasn't tested for nearly 20 years after. If it had been tested at the time, it would have been easier to link the murder to Ridgeway. After four more victims were found, the King County Sheriff's Office formed the Green River Task Force to investigate these murders. The task force would often interview serial killer Ted Bundy in 1984 to kind of hear his opinions, motivations, and kind of try to figure out the behavior of the killer. He even said how he thought the killer would come back and that he should they should actually stake out the sites. But apparently, they didn't listen. He was even arrested in 1982 and 2001 for charges related to prostitution, not murder. He even took a polygraph test about the murders in 1984 and passed this. Huh. Probably why they don't use him much these days, huh? Mm-hmm. So sometime in 1985, he dates and then marries Judith Mawson, his third wife. They ended up getting married in 1988. In an interview later in, the, uh, in 2010, she recalled how weird it was that his house had no carpet which is thought how he wrapped bodies in the carpet, which would explain why he had no carpet. He really loved Judith, and according to him in reports of the 49 known victims, only three were killed after he married her. Only three. <laughs> Disgusting. In 1987, during the dating period, police took hair and saliva from Ridgeway because of these samples that actually helped the DNA profiling evidence for an arrest warrant. November 30th, 2001, he was at Kenworth Truck Factory working away. The police show up, and they arrest him on that warrant. They arrest him on suspicion of murdering four women 20 years before the four victims. Named in the original indictment were Marcia Chapman, Opal Mills, Cynthia Hines, and Carol Ann Christensen. Three more victims, Wendy Caulfield, Deborah Bonner, and Deborah Estes, were added to the indictment after a forensic scientist identified microscopic spray paint spheres as a specific brand and composition, uh, composition of paint use, guess where, Meg? <laughs> At the Kenworth factory. Dun, during, dun, dun. during the time when these victims were killed. So, pretty wild. Again, mm -hmm. if they would have tested it right at the job site. Let's jump to August 2003. I know we're all over the place in the timeline, but I'm really trying to paint a picture as if I was a descendant of Bob Ross. Let's paint a pretty little gross crime, true crime podcast scene. They move from a maximum, they move him from a maximum security jail to a medium security jail. Apparently they were close to a plea deal that would spare him the death penalty in return for a confession to more murders. I don't think anybody was ready for the actual numbers that we already told you. November 5th. 2003 Ridgeway entered a guilty plea to 48 charges of aggravated first degree murder as part of that plea deal that we did already talk about that would spare him execution in exchange for his cooperation in locating the remains of the victims and providing other details to kind of give some closure to the family, you know? Mm -hmm. In a statement accompanying his guilty plea, Ridgway explained that he had killed all of his victims inside King County, Washington, and that he had actually transported and dumped the remains of the two women near Portland to confuse police. On December 18th, 2003, the sentence is in. 48 life sentences without parole to be served consecutively. He then gets another 10 years for tampering with evidence for each of the 48 victims, adding 480 years. Hopefully he's not a vampire and gets out. He led prosecutors to the bodies throughout 2003 and 2005. A hiker then finds a body that was also linked to him. Ridgway confessed to more and more and more murders. More murders than any other American serial killer. Over a five uh, period of five months. I didn't say that right. He didn't. I didn't say that right at all. We're going to rewind. <laughs> Over a period of five months <laughs> of police and prosecutor interviews, 
he confesses to the 48 murders, 40 of two, 42, which the police had on a list of probable Green Killer or Green River Killer victims. February 9th, 2004, county prosecutors began to release the videotape records of Ridgeway's confession. In one tape interview, he initially told investigators that he was responsible for 65 deaths. In another interview, New Year's Eve, 2003, where were you? Ridgeway claimed to have murdered 71 victims and confessed to having had sex with them before killing them, a detail which he did not reveal until after he was sentenced. In his confession, he acknowledged that he tar targeted prosecutes because, as he said, again, air quotes, they were easy to pick up and that he hated most of them, which, again, links back to childhood, his father, and his hatred for them as well. Ridgeway was then placed in solitary confinement at Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla. That should be number one on the Obviously, list over gonorrhea. That's fun to say. Walla Walla. Walla Walla. Wally. He was there in January 2004. May 14th, 2015, he was then transferred to the USP Florence High, a high-security federal prison, East Canyon City, Colorado. September 2015, after a public outcry and discussions with Governor Jay Inslee, Corrections Secretary Bernie Warner announced that Ridgeway would be transferred back to Washington to be easily accessible for open murder investigations. Ridgeway was returned by chartered plane to Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla from USP Florence High on October 24th, 2015. This story has been, you know, in documentaries, films, films that are fictional, non-fictional. Uh, books that were fictional, non-fictional, and even referenced in a ton of music. There was a list that was about a mile long. I wasn't going to bore you with the details. If you want to know about it, just look up the Greenway, uh, Green River Killer Gary Ridgeway, and you'll be able to see that list. Unbelievable, isn't it, Meg? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you to the sources. Wicka, wicka, Wikipedia. We love you as always. And to the bremertonschools.org. They had a cool little write-up about it. I was able to kind of, you know, grab some information and rewrite it there as well. So we do have a quote. I don't know if you want to do it. This is a quote from Gary himself. You can't go back and change the past. It's over with. All we can do is try to make it better. Hmm. Hmm. Someone inspirational from a terrible, <laughs> terrible person. So another state off the list and this was fun this was good we'd love to hear some recommendations for all of our your town listeners and meg i i did a kind of an updated list of all of the states and everything that we've done okay. and i we are 30 officially 32 states done 18 states to go wow right pretty cool but we've made it 73 weeks Pretty cool, huh? Mm -hmm. We're going to have to do something crazy for episode 100. Maybe for episode 100, we'll do something live. We'll go to a bar, a restaurant, a library, somebody that'll have us, and we'll do a live recording for all of our fans. Maybe. Maybe not. I don't know. We'll see. It's Either not a way, promise. It's not a promise. That's why I said maybe. That's also a fun word. Walla, walla. All right. <laughs> that sounds like one of those ringtones. It does, Like too. the notification. Yeah. Walla, walla. Walla, walla. That's probably what they say. <laughs> And it's the Green River Killer. But either way, can't thank you enough. We got a lot of things to do, places to be, people to see. If you see us out there, say hello. Tell us how much you love the Your Tom podcast. We'll be back next week. Please send over a recommendation so we can uh, jump into another episode, another state. And if you're looking, where is this state? Where is this map? Check out the yourtown.com or go to the Beard Laws, or not the Beard Laws, but beardlawstudio.com. We have the map and stuff over there as well. So that's all we got. Thanks, Mick. You're welcome. And happy. Labor Day. Hopefully everybody has enjoyed it and we'll be back next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.